Welcome to Enjoying Podcast. Today our guest is Stephen Holt, Assistant Professor in Politics, International Relations and Russia at the University of Bath, United Kingdom. At the end of May, it was reported that the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson proposed to the President of Ukraine to create an economic and military alliance with Ukraine, Poland and the Baltic states and possibly Turkey. Whether such initiative may appear an element of pressure on European countries that are quite inconsistent in helping Ukraine, especially in military terms? Well, I think that uh, there's already been a military alliance between Britain, Poland and Ukraine, and there has already been talk of creating a joint forces operation with Britain, the Baltic States, Iceland and, a few, and the Nordic countries as well, and Poland, of course. Um, if Turkey was to be involved, then that's even better. So I don't know whether it would actually put pressure on the, let's say, doves in regards to Europe, those who believe that um, there should be a negotiated settlement, principally those, and I'm not going to name names, who don't provide or haven't provided the weapons or rather have announced in their parliament that they are going to provide weapons and then lo and behold, they turn up, they go somewhere else or they don't exist. Or the other uh, leader who has said that he doesn't want Russia to be humiliated. Um, so not naming names, but it's quite clear who these are. But in terms of the pressure exerted by the British government, I don't think that is going to happen from Britain to these countries, to the Dutch. I think that Britain is a hawk in regards to the military action against Russia. And therefore, it is a way to try and combine the other hawks in Europe, principally Poland, the Baltic states, and others as well, possibly the Czechs, possibly other, the Nordic countries, who knows. But I don't think it's going to put too much pressure on the Dubs because Europe, for the most part, has been fairly united in terms of its uh, dislike of what Vladimir Putin has been doing, but it is starting to become divided. And I think that at the moment, the two camps are oppo not, not opposed to each other, but are working at different uh, aims for different aims and I don't think there needs to be any persuasion from one to the other. I think that if Britain and other countries can form an alliance to support Ukraine then all well and good. That should be the main purpose is the protection of course of Ukraine. Is uh, London ready to keep a more tougher line on Russia even if such policy will lead to contradictions with Paris and Berlin? And as I said I think Britain has been fairly hawkish throughout uh, the relationship. On the one hand, the relationship with Russian money is, is well documented in terms of London grad and what London has been doing in terms with Russian money. On the other hand, Britain has always been quite vociferous and against Russia, against Russian incursions, Russian, uh, the war machine, not just in Ukraine in 2014 and today, but Georgia in 2008. But we have to remember that Britain does rely an awful lot on the support of America. So it all depends on how far America is willing to go, depends on how far Britain is willing to go. At the moment, America is, yes, they are with Britain and the EU talking, there's been an idea from the New York Times, I think it was today, of an attempt to find some sort of negotiations that will then, the Ukrainians will be brought on side and we'll see whether they work, but that's by the by. So at the moment, America has remained committed to Ukraine and long may that continue. If America was to waver, then I think Britain would become more isolated. It would need American support for doing so, at least in terms of diplomatic support. I'm not saying the Americans would give the British weapons and then the British would send them on to Ukraine. But I think that Britain would find it increasingly hard to stand up to Russia by itself without the support of America. I don't think London is overly concerned, as I've said, about Paris and Berlin. Um, there will be, of course, talks between the British, French and German governments, as there always are. But, talk, but, London, but Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron do not seem to like each other too much. And I don't think Boris Johnson is overly concerned about that relationship. At the moment, we also have to remember that Britain is, for want of a better phrase, trying to renegotiate its uh, negotiations on Brexit. Um, and therefore, the relationship with France is very important as to uh, trying to get 
that deal through. So there will be that different, it's a division in terms of with Ukraine, not being overly concerned what France is doing, but not trying to, not criticizing France and Germany too much because Britain would like to have a better, at least in thinking of Boris Johnson, a better Brexit agreement. Great Britain may become one of the guarantors of Ukraine's sovereignty and security after the war. What commitments London can make after the ceasefire will be achieved? I think it all depends on what uh, the situation is at the time. I'm, you know, would like to see that Britain would commit to the defense of Ukraine. But if Russian troops are on Ukrainian territory, whether we believe that the Crimea, Crimea for instance, is Ukrainian territory or not, um, that's by the by. But if Russian troops are on Ukrainian territory in the Donbass, in Kherson, in uh, other places as well, then it will be very hard for Britain to commit to the defense, kind of like NATO, for Ukraine. At the same time, then I, I can envisage definitely that Britain would support militarily providing weapons to Ukraine and possibly even financial aid. Although, again, over the long term, this may dry up. As we saw with the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, it was a piece of paper, effectively, in 2014 and was largely ignored by, well, all three signature, signatures. So in terms of that, I, I can't imagine that... Britain would commit to the defense of Ukraine um, in terms of if Russia was to attack, invade for the third time. I don't think Britain would come to the aid of Ukraine, but Britain would probably support with military equipment Ukraine and aid to try to rebuild Ukraine. That's as far as I think it will go. But again, over the long term, this is open to the many, many other factors that might occur. Um, public opinion, of course, is particularly important for the British government at the moment, um, and public opinion is starting to wane on the issue of Ukraine. Um, Ukraine, it happened 100 days ago, and the British public have become more interested in inflation and monkeypox. And so this may also be a factor over time. It also depends on the next government, whoever that may be. Boris Johnson at the moment has a very low popularity rating. So standing up against Russia, to, against Russia supporting Ukraine, dealing with a bully uh, in, the, in the playground, as it were, like at school, is plays to the voters. How long that will last depends on how long Boris Johnson is unpopular, because Boris Johnson is many things, but he is a political comedian and he will change what it, whatever is going to keep him in power for as long will be what he will do the next day um, and to get, continue his popularity. So this is all what ifs at the moment, ifs and buts. But I think that certainly as things stand, the British government will not commit to supporting Ukraine if it was to be attacked, but it would and it will continue after the war when the, when the ceasefire happens to arm Ukraine and to provide economic assistance. I mean, I, I'm not a fan of Boris Johnson, uh, but I have to say that it has been fantastic that to see, some, to see Boris Johnson, who I never considered to be a leader, and as his, jo as his term as foreign minister showed, he was pretty incompetent, um, to put it mildly, but he has been fantastic in terms of dealing with, you know, supporting Ukraine, going to Kiev, support, providing weapons and, and uh, equipment he could they could do a lot better in terms of micro, you know allowing ukrainians to come to the uk that indeed was shocking the interior minister pretty patel saying that they were going they were going to limit the number of visas because russians may try and get through as if russians would go into ukraine at the moment and masquerade as ukrainians it was a really bizarre thing to say but anyway um Certainly, they've done a lot. Uh, the government, the British government, Boris Johnson, has been very vocal about this. And it's not just the government as it is today, the Conservative Party. Labour have also been vocal. Um, Keir Starmer, the opposition policy, opposition uh, shadow cabinet, have been very, very vocal at their anti-Russian stance, which for Labour, who have had a history of if not being pro-Russian, then at least um, being accommodating to Moscow is also quite a change, let's say. Um, compared to if Jeremy Corbyn 
had been leader of the opposition, then who knows what would have happened. But Labour has been also been very pro-Ukraine, very anti-Russian. And that, I think, is good in terms of the entire British political establishment. Similar to the Americans, it seems to be the only thing that with the Republicans and Democrats in America, with American politics being very polar, polarised at the moment, is the only thing that unites the American elites. The same is also true of Britain as well. With dom domestic affairs, Brexit, various other things, the in inflation, the collapsing of the economy are divide dividing, but the Ukraine war and a pro anti-Russian stance are uniting the British elite to a great extent. And that's, benefit, that's beneficial for if hypothetically there was an election held tomorrow and the Conservative government lost, then it's very unlikely that an anti-Ukrainian government would come to power unless somehow Jeremy Corbyn was to rise from the dead like a zombie and members of his uh, you know, clique were to come to power in, in Labour, which is almost impossible. So I think this is very, very good in, some, in, that, in those respects. Mr. Hall, given your academic interests, it would be interesting to highlight your vision of the evolution of the political regime in Russia in the near future. Whether Putinism may survive without Putin? I mean, the only way he's leaving, the only way he is leaving power is horizontally, um, unless he's, you know, uh, pushed out and retired to a small village in Siberia. Um, and if he is, if it is a coup, and that's still, I would say, unlikely, he will be replaced by someone to uh, more conservative, I imagine, than he. We're talking Petrushev, we're talking Bortnikov, someone in the Siliviki who honestly seem to believe that Poland has invaded Ukraine and Russia is sending in peacekeepers. Um, so they are living in their own time war. As I said at a pro-Ukrainian protest in Bath, this Russia is rapidly becoming a fascist state. And I think this is certainly the case that we are seeing a hardening of the regime. And even if Putin was to go tomorrow, and this is again speculative because we have heard rumours that he has cancer, various types of cancer, that he's ill, that he has Parkinson's, whatever. He seems to have numerous diseases all at the same time. Um, we simply don't know whether that's the case. He does seem to be in his own little world, the lack of intelligence that came, that Ukrainians would, Ukraine would collapse in three days. Having spent a lot of time in a bunker, reading history books, that does normally warp someone's mind. But by the by, whatever happens, if Putin was to be removed tomorrow or to die, it would come, someone from the Kremlin would take power. Someone from the inner circle would take power or from just outside the inner circle. And Putinism might be slightly changed like Shavkat Mirziyoyev when he took power in 2016 in Uzbekistan. You know, Karimov died and Mirziyoyev came to power and Little things changed. Yes, people no longer are forced to go and pick cotton, but the regime has pretty much stayed the same. And I think that the inner circle who are getting access to state resources, who are making money, will fight like cats in a bag in order to maintain that power. And the inner circle will, it might change, but it will be someone from the inner circle who takes power in Russia. I can't see street protests happening. I can't see the army stand, you know, in a, in a military coup. Russia does not have a history of military coups, apart from the August Putsch in 1991 in the Soviet Union, which failed miserably after three days um, because most of them were drunk. So I can't imagine that this is going to be anything that happens. Like I say, if Putin dies or is removed tomorrow, it will be someone probably from the security services. Um, and that is a scary proposition. Um, so that's the near future. In the long term, if everything is up, you know, how, how far do you want me to go in terms of the long term? But everything is up in the air uh, in the long term. I think the Putin system is um, regressive. I think that you know, um, the economy will be under sanctions probably for years to come. The West could have been better. It could have said, if you if you hold, if you remove Putin, we start to lower the sanctions. If you hold democratic elections, we start to lower the sanctions. 
because it would have shown that this isn't an attack on the Russian middle classes. This is an attack. This is sanctions against Putin, against the regime. This was a mistake of the West because now with the government, the Russian government, all it has to say with its state propaganda, as we know, is this is an attack. This is anti-Russianism. This is Russophobia. And this will unite Russians who are willing to almost go to the end for, uh, you know, being, having been told that, yes, it's going to be bad for a few years, but we will win. They are willing to do that. And I think also the Western sanctions have not gone close enough. They are attacking the Russian middle class who have no other capacity than to fall back on support for the regime and rally around the flag effect. So even in the long term, if there is no possibility, I think, of any sort of democratic elite coming into Russia. Um, and as Russia is clearly not going to be defeated militarily, yes, it might be pushed out of Ukraine, and we, we hope it is, but it's not that there's not going to be a liberation movement in Moscow. We're not going to see like the fall, the fall of Berlin in 1945 with the allies coming into Russia and building a democracy from the bottom up. That's simply not going to happen. So even if Putin was to lose, lose, lose power, even if the inner circle was to lose power, Russians will want someone who can bring stability and bring them Russia as a great power, which just means that the next Putin, will, next someone like Putin will stand up and say, I will leave Russia for a great tomorrow. And that will be the situation. That's how I see it. I could be very wrong and I really hope I am because I, I, my, my research is focused on Russia and the post-Soviet region. But that is how, unfortunately, at the moment I'm, I see things. Um, so I don't want to sound pessimistic, but that I think is the reality. So it uh, turns out that uh, the West finds itself at the crossroad. If Russia wins, their European security will be completely destroyed and Putin's expansionism will be even harder to stop. But in other case, if Ukraine wins, Russia will continue to accumulate a sense of revenge and uh, prepare for another war with Ukraine or even NATO. If Russia loses, then the resentment for, for the West, because this isn't now a war against Ukraine, it is a war against NATO, at least according to the Russian to state media in Russia. So this would cause serious resentment. Uh, and again, we would, you know, uh, and again, what, it, what, what is going to happen? Moscow is not going to be defeated. The NATO is not going to advance one iota into Russian territory. Um, and so how, do, how does this work? With Germany, they were defeated militarily and Germans were forced to bury the dead in Auschwitz. They were and Treblinka and various other places. That's simply not going to happen in Russia. So unless someone from Russia takes power and says we need to redesign, rethink our entire history, our culture, we need to talk about the concentration camps, we need to get rid of the stars, the Lenins, the Trotskys, where what have you, across Russia, then where, this is going to perpetuate, continue. That is a tragedy. Because Russia, regardless of our opinion, Russia is a wonderful, on a personal opinion, Russia is a wonderful country. It has a great culture. And to see this cycle of this idea of Russian greatness is, is a tragedy. Russia is, has so much, it could be a liberal country. It could be an economic powerhouse that is similar to Germany but its elites and perhaps even its people seem to want to go down this path and go off a cliff and coming from a country that did go off a cliff in 2016 this is quite worrying and um, so you know of course i hope of course i want ukraine to win of course having been to ukraine on numerous occasions it's a wonderful country and it, does, it should be independent of course it is and to say that ukraine and russia are the same people is reprehensible. But at the moment, there is, there is something that needs to be found in terms of what do we do with Russia? Because if, as we said, if Russia wins, then the Baltics, other, country, post, other countries, Belarus, Moldova, they're in real trouble. If Russia loses, 
the world is again in real trouble because this will happen again in 15, 20 years time. And I don't have an answer. And that's the really sad thing about this.